Hello everybody and welcome to another audiobook by me, Ozone. Today we're going to be reading Sea Bonnies. We're going to go straight on from Friendly Face, which was an awesome story, to hopefully another banger. Uh, this is my first time reading it, of course, you're going to get my full reaction. And uh, yeah, this is Sea Bonnies. Let's get straight into it, I cannot wait. Mott lingered at the edge of the arcade in Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria and contemplated why he still liked this place so much. Was it the decor, the food, the animatronics? No. The truth was that Freddy's, bright, loud, and always over the top, was just a fun place to be. He turned and surveyed the dining area stretching out from the arcade. Even the parents were having a good time. Technically, he should have been growing out this place, but Freddy's had a way of getting under the skin. Mott? Mott looked down at Rory, his spastic little brother. Can we get more tickets? Rory asked. I always beat Ben at air hockey. I need a do-over. Yo, is that Ben from Into the Pit? That's, that's cool. Mott reached out to ruffle Rory's bright red hair. Predictably, Rory, who recently turned seven and was too grown up for things like hair ruffling, darted out of Mott's reach and said, Mott, in a way that turned one syllable into three. It would be like, Mott. Okay. <laughs> Mott laughed and pulled a wad of dollar bills from his jean pocket. Uh, go beat the pants off him. Rory grinned, grabbing the money and took off. On the stage that ran the length of Freddy's dining room, Fred Frasbear and his cohorts, Bonnie and Chica, began a new song. A spinning disco ball overhead started spraying beams of yellow, red, green and purple light all over the pizzeria. Mott tapped his foot and began singing along under his breath. Mott! A ghoul girl called out. He turned to look at the packed tables. A couple of four and five year olds bumped into him as they went racing past. He smiled. Had he run around non stop like that when he was their age? If he had, he could understand his mum's claim that he was responsible for 90% of the wrinkles forming on her still young face. Over here, the girl called again. He saw a slender, pink nailed hand waving from a table a few feet away. It was Teresa, one of the popular girls in his class. He grinned at her glanced once to check on Rory, and then sauntered ov over uh, Freddy's black and white checkered floor. Teresa shared a red cloth covered pizza and soda laden table with a man and a woman who had to be their parents. They all shared the same warm brown, almost amber eyes, although neither parent had Teresa's gorgeous smile. Her parents were turned away from her, talking animatedly with another couple at the next table. Mott heard something about golf and the cost of airfare. Mott turned his attention to Teresa. Friendly, smart and petite, Teresa was what his mum called a catch. Though they shared English and algebra classes, they hadn't talked much outside, outside class. Still, she always smiled at him in the hallways. Hey Teresa, hi Mott, are you here alone? Teresa gestured at the empty chair next to her and Mott took it. A ponytailed server on roller skates zipped past with a fresh pizza. Aromas of tomato, basil, and cheese teased Mott's nose. His mouth watered. He hadn't eaten before he and Rory came here, figuring they'd get a pizza right away. But Rory had been obsessed with the game since they arrived, and they hadn't ordered anything yet. Mott was getting so hungry that even the sickly sweet blue frosted birthday, birthday cake that sat near the stage was starting to look good. No, he said. I'm here with my little brother. He's friends with the birthday boy. Same here, my little brother too. Which one is yours? Mott asked, mainly because he had no idea what else to say. Teresa pointed at a boy with dark curls, <laughs> dark curls, uh, dancing with a bunch of little kids up next to the stage. Yours? She said. He looked over at the arcade. Rory's bright hair made him easy to spot. He and Ben had left their air hockey table and were charging this way. Rory probably wanted more money for tokens. Wow. Really? He doesn't look like you, Teresa said. Mott wasn't sure what to say to that, so he just shrugged. But she was right. Rory got his red hair from their mother. Mott had their dad's plain brown hair, thankfully. Rory with tufts of red that refused to lie down properly on his head, his over-large eyes and mouth, and his face full of freckles, was always going to be the kind of goofy looking. Mott, on the other hand, had been getting girls' stares long before he wanted to. When he turned 13 a few months before, he finally began to welcome all that attention. According to his mum, he was objectively good-looking. 
The components of this assessment apparently were his naturally wavy hair, his hooded dark brown eyes, his strong chin, and his great teeth. In the last couple of months, he'd also shot up a few inches, and he'd started working out. His shoulders were getting broad. He was beginning to see what his mum saw. Apparently, girls like Teresa were seeing it too. Yo, so, <laughs> this is like the opposite of to be beautiful. To be ugly. <laughs> Don't let it go to your head, his mum had told him. If you do, I'll ground you for the rest of your life. Smiling at the memory, he said to Teresa, On a good day, I'll admit Rory looks like our mum. On a bad day, I'd tell him he was left on our doorstep by sea monkeys. Oh, sea monkeys, okay, okay. Rory raced up to the table just in time to hear what Mott had said. I was not, he shouted. Then he stuck out his hand. I want more tickets. Mott sighed and dug in his pocket for a few more dollars. He had paid several hundred dollars to make Rory go away so he could keep talking to Teresa. Rory took the money uh, Mott held out and ran off without saying thank you. Teresa laughed, then made a face. I hate sea monkeys. Mott laughed too. Exactly. Creepy little things, he winked. The real ones, not my brother. Teresa shivered. I know what you mean. The real ones are like centipedes with tentacles and tails. Sounds absolutely disgusting. Freddy and his band... Sedued, <laughs> sedued into another corner or another co cover of a popular song, this one with a rocking beat. Teresa scooted her chair closer to Mott. This is a good song, don't you think? Mott nodded. I do, but I think I like this group's ballads better. He named another song by the same group who'd originally done this one. Teresa bounced in her seat. Oh yeah, that's a really good one. You like ballads? I'm learning to play the guitar and that's what I like to sing. I'd love to hear you sing sometime, Mott said. Teresa beamed at him. They spent the next several minutes talking music, and Mott had pretty much forgiven, uh, sorry, forgotten where he was until he glanced up and saw Rory galloping over, bouncing off a couple other few little kids and two tables as he came. He was grinning wildly, and he held up what looked like a new toy, something in bright-coloured cardboard and plastic packaging. Rory was going so fast that when he got to the table, he ploughed right into Mott and started to lose his balance. Mott grabbed his brother's arm and kept them upright. Look what I got, Mott! Rory half yelled, half screamed. He was only a few inches from Mott now, and Mott winced at the excessive decibel level. As, often he, as he often did, he wished Rory had a volume control he could dial down. Rory's blaring announcement had gone to Reza's and her parents' attention. They all smiled at Rory as Mott asked, with as much enthusiasm as he could muster, What did you get? Rory started waving around his treasure. He waved it so rapidly that Mott still couldn't tell what it was. He frowned, trying to read the words on the waving package. Sea bonnies, Rory said. I got sea bonnies. Look. He kept waving the package. I'm trying to look, Mott said. He reached out and snatched the package. Rory jumped up and down like he was on an invisible pogo stick. Mott focused on the package in his hand. Against a black checkered background, bright red letters announced that the package contained astounding live sea bonnies, under the words the image of a seriously disquieting little purplish blue creature that appeared to be a cross between a sea monkey and a rabbit, was encircled by a bright blue blob of what was supposed to what was probably supposed to be water. Next to the image the package promised contains everything you need to grow and nurture your own sea bonnies. Beneath that, plastic sheathing covered four packets, designed to start your own healthy colony of happy sea bonnies. There were two packets of sea bonnies live eggs, one of sea bonnie water purification powder and one of sea bonnie super duper growth food at the bottom of the packaging. Bright blue letters proclaimed Guaranteed to live for three years. Ha <laughs> ha. Guaranteed. I bet, I bet they're not. Uh, Mott made a face and looked at Rory. Really? Rory was still hopping up and down. Now he giggled and shouted. You said sea monkeys left me on the doorstep. Not sea monkeys. Sea bonnies. What? Oh, right. Uh, Rory let loose with one of his high-pitched laughs. He clearly thought he was hilarious. He spun in a gleeful circle. Now I can have some of my real brothers and sisters around. He laughed some more, quite pleased with himself. Mott shook his head. He felt Teresa leaning in behind him, and he showed her the package. Ew, she said. He nodded in agreement. 
Rory plucked the package from Mott's hand. They're awesome. Sure they are, Mott said. As soon as Mott and Rory got home, Rory darted into the kitchen to find their mother, who was tearing up lettuce for a salad. Beef stew simmered on a six-burner Viking range that was his mum's pride and joy. She loved to cook. Rory showed his mum the sea bonnies package and started talking non-stop as he climbed up onto one of the wood stools in front of the granite-covered island where she worked. Their mum set the lettuce aside and began chopping tomatoes and cucumbers for the salad. For one blissful moment, all Mott could hear was the faint hum of the fan above the range, the intermittent tap of his mum's knife against the cutting board, and the delicious stew bubbling. But then Rory started jabbering, and all Mott could hear was his chatterbox of a brother. Rory, ra- Rory waved his sea bonnies package under his mother's nose. She blinked at it, but kept working on the salad. Rory didn't seem to care. Sea bonnies are basically like sea monkeys, but they're genetically engined to look like Bonnie. You know, Bonnie from Freddy's, Rory said. Mott and his mother exchanged a smile at Rory's version of genetically engineered. Rory kept talking. They're super cool looking, and Fazbro Entertainment only came out with them last month. That's what Ben said. He usually buys all the new stuff, but his parents wouldn't let him get any sea bonnies because they said pewter might eat them, and they didn't think that would be good for pewter, and that wouldn't be good for the sea bonnies either. He giggled wildly. Mott looked at his mum over the top of Rory's head. He shrugged. Wearing her usual stay-at-home clothes, black yoga pants and a baggy white shirt, his mum brushed a strand of red hair from her blue eyes. She scratched her freckled nose and smiled. Pewter is the family cat, right? His mum said. Hmm? Oh, yeah, Rory said. Don't you think I should get a bigger fish tank now that Fritz is going to have friends? Oh, no. Oh, no, there's a child called Fritz. Okay. Oh, God, this is going to change everything, I bet. Wait. So. Huh, that's, that's strange. Because we've had like a... I'm not, I'm not going to talk about that right now. I might talk about it in the theory video. I mean, I know the small one fits on my desk and the sea bonnies can help Fritz keep me company while I do homework and colour and stuff. But, oh, wait. Fritz is a fish. <laughs> I just realised Fritz is a fish. Never mind. But if we got me a big tank with a stand, I could put it on the other side of the room, under the window. Oh, no, wait. What if we got a huge one and we put it in the living room? Oh, no, wait. Then I wouldn't have any in my room. Wait, then I wouldn't have them in my room. I think I want them in my room. Maybe I could get more and we could get two tanks and... While Rory talked and Mott tried not to listen to him, their mother wiped her hands on a dish towel. She stepped over and gently put her hand over Rory's mouth. Uh, take a breath, sweetie, she said. It's genetically engineered, Mott said in the blessed quiet that suddenly filled the kitchen. Not genetically engined, his mum gave him a look and shook her head. He rolled his eyes. She crossed the shiny wood floor to the stainless steel refrigerator and opened it to grab a bottle of salad dressing. Do sea bonnies have the same water temperature requirement that Fritz has? She asked. Rory said, huh? May I see the package? Mott asked Rory. Rory shrugged and handed it over. Mott scanned the instructions on the back of the package. He frowned. Isn't it 74 degrees now? His mother nodded. Oh wait, 74 degrees. Isn't that the temperature in FNAF VR? Right, a perfect 74 degrees. <laughs> Thank you for working at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, is that the temperature? I feel like it is. Huh, interesting. Oh, because that's the temperature that Remnant used to be at. So could sea bonnies be like alive from the souls of children. No, I'm, I'm joking. I don't know. The water needs to be 75 to 81 degrees for them to hatch. Then it can go back down. I wonder if cranking it up to like 78 or something would be okay for a goldfish for the 24 hours it takes to hatch the sea bunny eggs. Maybe you can research that after dinner, his mum said. Mott shrugged. Sure, why not? That's what all the cool kids do on the Saturday nights. She laughed. No, that's what all the cool kids wish they were doing. Instead, they're going to boring things like movies and parties. I feel sorry for them, Mott said. Rory, who had been examining his sea bonnies with great pride and joy, suddenly pointed at a spot on the package. What's that word? Mott looked under his brother's dirty index finger. Colony. What's a colony? 
Mott to let his mum take that one. When she finished defining the word, Rory screwed up his face and announced, I want an empire, not a colony. That's bigger, right? Maybe I should get another package of them. One package is enough, his mum told him. Rory squinted and took a deep breath, in clear preparation for a loud rebellion. Mott spoke quietly. You can call it whatever you want, you know. Rory tilted his head. I can? Absolutely, Mott and his mum said in unison. Uh, after dinner, and after determining that Fritz wouldn't be harmed by a day or so of 28 degree water, Mott helped Rory get his tank set up for the sea bodies. Rory's tank was small, maybe 16 inches by 10 inches or so. It held 5 gallons, more water than Fritz needed, but Mott thought Fritz always looked content in his domain. Mott idly wondered what Fritz would think about the soon-to-be interlopers. Did fish think? Lifting the tank's lid and waiting while, while Rory said hello to Fritz, Mott opened the sea bony packaging. Okay, first step, he told Rory, is to put this in. He handed Rory the packet of water purifier. At Rory's insistence, he read the ingredients, salt, some kind of water conditioner, and some brined shrimp eggs. That's all we can do today, Mott, Mott told a frustrated Rory when his little brother wanted to dump all the p other packets in too. The instructions say to wait 24 hours, then we'll put in the eggs. Those will be the genetically engineered eggs. Why do we have to wait? Rory scowled. Mott shrugged. Because the packaging says so. He didn't bother telling Rory that the whole process was weird. He read the contents of the eggs packet, and he was surprised to see it also contained ye yeast, borax, soda, salt, and blue dye. What about this? Rory asked, holding up the food packet. Mott referred to the instructions. That goes in after the eggs hatch. The food packet contained more yeast and some more, uh, spirulina. It would have been, it, it would have to be added every few days. Because Mott didn't trust Rory not to dump everything in the tank at once, he took the packets when he left Rory's room. Rory protested, but when he started to throw a tantrum, then mum appeared to smooth things over. Mott felt bad that she had to intervene. Their dad was a commercial airplane or airline pilot who was often away, which meant mum had to run the house and do most everything at home. She also worked full-time as an event planning firm and was trying to start her own company in her spare time, of which she had little, to compound matters. Most of the events she planned happened in the evening and she had to be there to oversee them. Mott wasn't sure when his mum slept, and even with all that, she never acted annoyed when she interrupted. When she was interrupted, Mum, Mott said, "I'll get him ready for bed. Go rest." Sure, she asked. Sure, you're a good son, his mum said. I know, he laughed. With just a little wheedling, Mott got Rory into the bathroom to brush his teeth. While he brushed, Rory chatted about school and his friends and the new puppy that Danny and his family had gotten a few weeks before. Toothpaste shot all over the place as Rory talked. Used to his used to this routine, eh, used to this routine, Mott wiped down the counter and the floor. Eventually, Rory split the remainder of his toothpaste into the sink. Mott used a wet washcloth to wipe Rory's face. Rory wriggled out of his reach. I want a puppy, Rory said. When's Dad coming home? He's doing non-stops this week, Mott said. He'd opted for answering the second question first. It was easier. I think he'll be home for a few days next week. Maybe he'll get us a puppy when he's home, Rory said. Maybe mum will get us a puppy when you demonstrate a little responsibility. Rory twisted his lips in concentration. How do I do that? Mott considered what he could get away with. Well, maybe if you cleaned up your room, didn't yell so much and stopped interrupting me and mum whenever, Rory shouted, No! I know what I can do! Shh! Rory lowered his voice. Just to just above normal volume. I can help Danny with the pup. The pup? Mott repeated. That's the puppy's name, his dad kept asking. Where's the puppy? And his mum said that they might as well call him that. His whole name is the puppy, but they call him the pup. Danny likes to follow the pup around and say over and over, what's up the pup? Rory giggled, Jeev, gli uh, Rory giggled gleefully. Mott laughed. He couldn't help it. Rory was a lot of annoying things, but he was also entertaining as all let get out. Apparently, so were Danny and his family. Okay, 
Mott said. Let's get you to bed. Following Rory into his room, Mott shut Rory's bedroom door so Rory's jibber-jabber didn't bother their mother. Now Danny's bugging his parents for a kitten, Rory went on. He wants to name it the cat or the kitten. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Why is that so hilarious? Rory launched himself toward his bed, spun in midair and landed on his back. He kicked his legs in the air like an upturned beetle and let out another trill of giggles. Where are your PJs, goofus? Mott asked. Rory sat up, his eyes dancing. He, grab he grabbed his pillow. Under the bed, doofus. Mott bent over to look under the bed and a pillow hit him in the side of the head. He rose to find Rory looking at the ceiling and whistling. Mott glanced around as if searching for something. Hmm. A pillow just hit me in the head. I wonder where it came from, Rory giggled. Did it come from under the bed? Mott asked. He stuck his head under the bed and spotted green and yellow dinosaur patterned PJs. As he reached for them, another pillow struck his shoulders. Mott whipped his head out from under the bed and jumped to his feet. Feigning shock and outrage, he dropped the PJs on the bed. Another one? Is there an invisible pillow thrower in the room? He, he whirled in a circle, wearing a fierce expression as Rory giggled louder. Show yourself, you pillow throwing milksop! Mott leaned over and picked up the thrown pillows. I'll beat you in a fair fight if you have the metal. Or metal. I, I don't know how you say that word. <laughs> he struck a warrior pose, both pillows raised. Rory, struggling against the rising tide of giggles, shouted, What's a milksop? And why does he need metal? Oh, there we go. <laughs> nice one. Mott cocked his head. Hark! Me thinks these questions are a misdirect. He glowered at Rory. Dost thou do the pillow throwers bidding, young lad? Are thee in cahoots with the Nambi Pambi? Rory laughed so hard he snorted. He reached for the only remaining pillow on the bed. Mott turned his back to Rory and pretended to look for the pillow thrower again. The third pillow hit him in the back. Outrageous! He bellowed, leaning to pick up the latest pillow. He rotated to face Rory. I've got no choice but to unleash my retaliation upon thine own countenance, young minion of the invisible pillow thrower. Making sure he didn't throw too hard, Mott fired all three pillows at Rory, who dove under the covers squealing and laughing. Mott fell on him and started tickling him. Rory shrieked and, louded laugh and laughed louder. Dost thou surrender? Mott asked. Rory gasped. Yes, yes. His breath smelled like his peppermint toothpaste. Mott stopped tickling his brother. Rory, his face flushed, his eyes wet with happy tears, grinned up at Mott. You didn't answer my question. Mott reached for the PJs, which had landed on the floor again during the roughhousing. What? Oh, you mean milk sop and metal? Rory nodded. Mott handed Rory his PJs. Put these on. A milksop is someone who is indecisive or doesn't have courage. It comes from how little kids used to sop up milk with their bread. Rory frowned, then nodded. I like that word. And it's M-E-T-T-L-E, -T not M-E-T-A-L, Mott said as Rory pulled on his PJ top. Metal, he spelled it again. Means the ability to cope with difficulties, someone who can bounce back from an attack easily. Rory exchanged his jeans for his PJ pants. That's another good word. I agree, Mott said. Let's get you under the covers. Rory yawned and crawled under the covers, head first. Mott rolled his eyes. Turn around, goofus. Rory giggled from under the covers. He rotated and he and his towel tousled head appeared. What's Nampy Pampy? Or Nambi Pambi? Mott helped Rory get situated in bed. It's another word for milksop, but it also means someone without much strength. I'm not a mamby pamby or a milksop, Rory said. No, you aren't, Mott agreed. That was adorable. That was a very adorable scene. <laughs> adorable. Mott got home late on Monday evening. He and his two best friends, Nate and Lyle, that's a really stupid name... Oh my god. I mean, if you're called Lyle, if someone's watching this and you're called Lyle, I think that's how you say it, then I apologise. I Nothing against you, but like, how do you pronounce it? Is it Lyle? I'm going to say Lyle, but hopefully it is Lyle. Because uh, it looks like Kyle, but without the K and with an L. 
uh, Nate and Lyle who had to work on a science project and they'd met at Nate's house to work on it. Nate's dad, Dr. Tabor, aka Dr. T, was a pediatrician who had been Mott's doctor since Mott was a baby. Nate and Mott had become friends because they'd met Dr. They'd met at Dr. Tabor's office when they were about two. Dr. T's wife, an engineer, had an important meeting that day, so Dr. T had brought his son to work with him. Nate and Mott had taken over the blocks in the waiting room playing area, building an impressive thought fort that none of the other kids in the waiting room were allowed to touch. Dr. T had told Mott's mum that the boys' friendship clearly was meant to be, and suggested the parents get together for dinner while the kids had a playdate. Or at least, that's what Mott's mum had told him. He didn't remember any of it. All he knew was that his, pens, uh, his, fa- uh, his parents were good friends with Nate's parents, and he was good friends with Nate. His earliest memory of Nate was the two of them trying to climb up on a counter to steal freshly baked cookies. They both ended up in Dr. T's office with con- contusions and mild burns from the hot cookie sheets. Not that Mott remembered that either, he just remembered the chair ladder they'd built, and he remembered a lot of pain. Over the years, Dr. T had become like a dad to Mott. Dr. T believed that work and home life should be properly balanced, so he opened his clinic near the neighbourhood, close to the end of the greenbelt that ran past the back of Mott's house. Dr. T started work really early, but he never worked late, never worked weekends, and he was always ready and willing to pay or to play or help with school. Tonight he was helping the boys get started on their science project, which was a study of the effects on antibiotics on microorganisms. Having access to a doctor came in handy. Dr. T had been given a small amount of four types of antibiotics. Oh, for goodness sake, the writers just put this in here so that I can't say them. Okay. Penicillin. I know that one. Streptomycin. Oreomycin. And teramycin. He'd also gotten a strange... Uh, sorry, a syringe, a petri dish, flasks and beakers, and some pipettes. Mott and his friends had been tasked with getting everything else they'd need. A potato, agar, dextrose, distilled water, garden soil, and pens that would write on glass. When they'd complained about their agar and the dextrose, what in the heck are those? Nate had asked his dad. Dr. T had gotten them too. I know a lot about agar. We, we did a lot of experiments in school with agar, where you, uh, you like put it on a door handle and see how many germs are on it. It's kind of weird. Dr. T and Nate had already done 99% of the experiment. Lyle was bored out of his mind and mostly tried to make music with the pipettes and the beakers. Mott wasn't bored, but he was puzzled by the complex process. What with, his, what, what with this being heated and that being mixed in? Thanks to Dr. T, he did eventually understand what they were doing, and he was looking forward to see what microorganism colonies grew in the petri dishes that they set next to the heat register in Nate's house. They had bets going on which antibiotics would keep the, two, the colonies from growing. Two cheeseburgers and a milkshake on penicillin, Nate said. I'll take that bet, Lyle said. If we throw in a couple large fries, how about you, Mott? I'm in with Nate, Mott said. Lyle rolled his eyes. Well then, if you're wrong, it had better be two milkshakes. You're going down, Nate said. Mott laughed with his friends and said goodnight. He biked home a little after nine, which was when it was dark. When he pulled his bike into the garage, Rory met him at the door leading into the kitchen, flailing around in excitement. Come look, come look! Mott followed his exuberant brother up the stairs and down the long hallway, pausing only to drop his backpack in his own room. When they went into Rory's room, he pointed and stumped back and forth in front of his desk, as if performing a ceremonial dance on the strewn clothes and toys all over his blue shag rug covered floor. Look, he shouted. Mott stepped over a plastic cement truck, a cardboard castle and two spaceship models to stand before Rory's fish tank, which sat on Rory's desk, surrounded by a clutter of school books, colouring books, puzzles and crayons. Even partially hidden by all the piles, it was clear that the tank no longer contained just water and fritz. It was now filled with tiny, wriggling shapes. Mott leaned over to get a better look. He immediately wished he hadn't. Straightening, Mott rubbed away the goosebumps that had just erupted all over his forearms. Oh, this is just wrong. Are they great? Rory asked. Mott rolled his eyes. You're serious? You're a seriously weird little kid. What are you? Part sea monster? Are you part... He gulped loudly. Creep from the deep beyond? Rory stumped 
uh, stopped stomping in glee and turned to frown at Mott. What do you mean by that? Although he'd leaned away from the tank, Mott hadn't been able to pull his gaze from the disgusting things swimming around in the goldfish uh, in the tank. The sea bunnies had hatched. Dozens of them. No, make that hundreds. They looked like semi-translucent, fleshy, pale, bluish-purple rabbits with tiny black eyes and almost microscopic furry tentacles lining their bodies. From what Mott could tell, they appeared to propel themselves through the water using their misshapen rabbit ears. Rory tugged on the hem of Mott's brown polo shirt. Huh? Mott said. Why did you say that? Why did you say I'm part sea monster? Rory punched Mott's leg hard enough to make Mott grimace. That was mean. Ignoring his brother's upset, uh, Mott pointed to the sea bodies. Do you actually like these things? He asked. Rory turned to look at them, his hurt feelings forgotten. He grinned. Sure, they're super coolio. Mott crossed his arms. Rory, they're disgusting. They are not. Rory kicked out at Mott and barely missed Mott's shin. That's not nice to say stuff like that. You're going to make them feel bad. <laughs> he reached out to the fish tank and stroked the glass like he was trying to soothe his mutant pets. Whatever, Mott scoffed. He started to turn away and leave the room, but an abrupt movement in the tank yanked his gaze back to the sea bonnies. He lifted his eyebrows. The sea bonnies had moved in a giant cluster, to where Rory's hand had brushed against the side of the tank. Fritz still swam lazily at the far side of the tank, but the sea bonnies were all together near the glass under Rory's hand. It was like they were responding to his gesture. It's like one of those uh, plasma balls, you know? <coughs> the, the, like the plasma... They are called plasma balls, aren't they? Yeah, it's like one of them. It follows the movement on the glass. The goosebumps reappeared on Mott's arms. He shook his head, annoyed with himself for being unnerved by tiny, deviant uh, brine shrimp. Their movement must have been some kind of reflexive response to motion or shadow, he figured. He turned toward the door to Rory's room. Apologise, Rory said. Mott stopped and gave Rory a look. To you or your swimming freaks there? Rory put both his fists on his skinny hips. Both! Mott laughed at his brother. A burbling sound came from the fish tank, and Mott's attention returned to it. He blinked and stared. Although Fritz still floated toward the back of the tank, the sea bonnies had shifted so they were lined up, in a disturbingly ordered formation, along the front of the fish tank. He couldn't tell for sure because they were so small, but from where he stood, it looked to Mott like all the sea bonnies were facing forward, looking at him. Mott swallowed hard and took a step back. Obviously the sea bonnies weren't in any sort of formation and they weren't looking at him. That wasn't possible. Mott, say your story, Rory yelled. What's going on in here? Mott turned to see his mum standing in the doorway of Rory's room. She had a blue laundry basket full of fo folded clothes propped against her waist. Rory charged over to her and threw his bony arms around her thighs. He spewed out his grievance so fast that his words bunched up together. Mott called me a sea monster and he insulted my sea bonnies. He said they were disgusting and he was mean and he, and he didn't apologise. Damn it, I messed up at the end. No! <laughs> Mott's mum used her free hand to pat Rory's shoulder. She looked at Mott over the top of Rory's head and raised one eyebrow. Mott knew that look. It said, you're not wrong, but can you humour your little brother? He sighed and nodded. Rory? Rory sniffed and turned to frown at Mott. Mott squatted to look Rory in the eye. I'm very sorry I insulted you and your friends. I was just kidding but I shouldn't have kidded you that way. He noticed that Rory had a smudge of chocolate at the corner of his pouty lips and several bl blonde crumbs on the front of his green and blue striped shirt. Striped shirt, ooh! <laughs> his breath smelled like the chocolate chip cookie he'd nearly, he'd clearly snuck from the kitchen. Oh, aw, Rory is so cute in this. Mott reached out and cleaned up both crumbs and chocolate with his thumb. Rory squirmed away and said begrudgingly, it's okay. Mott glanced at the sea bonnies. He realised that he was, checkingly, uh, he was checking them because he wanted to see if his apology had modified them any more than it had his brother. They were swimming around in the tank, exactly as you would, you would expect sea monkey-like creatures to do. He must have imagined their earlier behaviour. But why would he have done that? What, was he that freaked out by the abnormal little creatures? He rotated back to his mother. Can I help with any of that? He waved a hand at the laundry basket. She flashed him a smile. 
I've got it. Go ahead. I assume you only worked on science at Nate's, right? Mott nodded. She was right. He still had more homework to do. Mott started to leave the room, but he hesitated when he heard his name being whispered. He looked back at his mum, who was tucking socks into one of the drawers in Rory's dresser. Did you say something? He looked at her. Uh, sorry, he asked her. She looked over at him. Nope. Oh no, <gasps> I know what's happening. He stepped into the hallway and he heard it again. A whisper. Mott. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh. Ooh. And more. This time, he also heard Scaredy Cat. He whirled and glared at Rory. What did you just call me? Both Rory and their mum widened their eyes at Mott. What in the world, Mott? He frowned. Rory didn't just... I'm not doing anything wrong, Rory said. Anything wrong? His mum said automatically. To Mott, she said, What did you think you heard? He shook his head. He had to have been imagining things. Suddenly, he realised that the whisper he'd heard hadn't been either his mother's or his brother's voice, and come to think of it, the whisper hadn't been a single whisper. It had sounded like several whisper tones coming in unison, mostly together but just slightly off, resulting in a faint echo. It couldn't be. He glanced at the fish tank. The sea bodies were swimming around aimlessly until he looked. Then they suddenly swam to the end of the tank as a unit. They all looked through the glass at him. He opened his mouth to ask his mum if she was seeing what he was seeing, and he immediately realised what a bad idea that was. Pull it together. Their brains aren't large enough to understand complex speech, let alone generate it. Instead, he returned to his room. Clearly, he needed some sleep. After closing his door, Mott stared at the knob for an uncomfortable moment. He locked it. The next morning, Rory was in a dither because he couldn't find his lucky striped socks, which he had to wear because he and his best friend Danny were going to have a swing off during recess. And this is more important than me preparing for my algebra quiz, Mott muttered as he poured through Rory's drawers in frustration. Not to mention getting to talk to Teresa before class, he thought. He heard a whispered response to his internal dialogue. As if a girl would pay attention to you. Mott whipped his head toward Rory, but Rory wasn't even in the room. Mott was in there, alone. Or not. He, he turned toward the fish tank. Sure enough, the sea bonnies were all clustered at the end nearest to Mott. They were watching him again. Before he knew what he was doing, he spat back. You're just glorified fish bait. Rory ran into the room. What do you say? He held up one of his striped socks. This was in the hamper. I don't know where the other one is, though. Ungluing his eyes from the fish tank, Mott noticed his heart rate had picked up. He swallowed and said, very slowly and very calmly, Why don't you go check Mum's room? Maybe your socks got mixed up with hers by mistake. When I'm done looking in here, I'll check my socks. Okay. Rory scampered out the room. Mott looked at the sea bonnies and he flinched. The water in the fish tank was choppy. He could hear it sloshing and he could see bubbles shooting up through the middle of the tank. The sea bodies were agitating as a group, as if, as if they were... Mott strode out of Rory's room, and he ran straight into Rory. Oof! <laughs> I love Rory. Oof! Rory grunted loudly. He bounced off Mott and grinned. Look! He held up a pair of striped socks, not his own, but similar in colour. Mum's letting me wear her lucky socks. She says they're even luckier than mine. Mott tried to talk, but couldn't. He was too busy processing what he'd just seen. Rory didn't seem to notice. He went around Mott and dropped to the floor to put on his mother's socks. Mott's head was suddenly throbbing. He rubbed his temple. Could simple organisms like sea bonnies even get angry? Because that was what it had looked like in Rory's tank. It looked like the sea bonnies were reacting to his insult. And before that, it had sounded like they'd been taunting him again. M Mott? His mum put her hand against his forehead. You feel warm. Are you coming down with something? Do you want to stay home from school? No. Ah, there was his voice. His mum raised her eyebrows. Okay, okay. Wow, I'm, I must have the weirdest teen in recorded history. I give him a chance to s skip school and he jumps down my throat. Mott coughed and moistened his teeth with his tongue. Sorry mum, I don't mean to snap at you, it's just that his mum's phone rang and she raised a finger. Thankful for the rep reprieve, Mott went into his room to get his backpack. Rory thundered in behind him. I'm going to take Danny down, he announced. He 
He flexed non-existent muscles and puffed his cheeks. Mott turned Rory around and gave him a gentle push out into the hallway. His mum got off the phone and looked at her sons. Are we ready? Let's get out of here, Mott said. He winced at his mum's strange look. I mean, let's go. Mott was in no honey. Mott was in no hurry to get home that afternoon. But he couldn't come up with a decent excuse to be late. His mum had asked him to bike over to the grade school and escort Rory home. And she'd asked him to look after Rory until she got home later that evening. He promised he would do that. If he broke his promise, it would mess up her work. Mott had hoped that when he got home, he could get Rory to play outside. But rain started coming down on their way home. And it was steady by the time they put their bikes away. Go get dried off, Mott said to Rory. Then come to my room and I'll help you with your homework. No, you come to my room, Rory said. I'm supposed to write a poem about something that I have that I like a lot. I'm going to write about my sea bunnies. You have to help me. Oh, joy, Mott said. Mott was a little unnerved to notice that his hands were shaking when he left his backpack in his room. Really? He was afraid of tiny squirming sea critters confined to a glorified fishbowl? Get a grip, he, bre he breathed as he went down the hall into Rory's room. Rory sat at his desk, uh, a piece of paper in front of him, a pencil grasped tightly in his right hand. He was staring raptly at his sea bonnies. Mott eyed the tank warily. For a few seconds after his gaze landed on the sea bonnies, they swam around normally. Then, as if they realised he was in the room, they suddenly shot to the end of the tank and lined up in formation. Hundreds of pinhead-sized black eyes appeared to be focused directly on him. Rory! What? Rory's gaze didn't leave the tank. Do you see what they're doing? Mott asked. Huh? Rory looked over at Mott. The sea bonnies, see how they're, they're all lined up? Rory looked at the sea bonnies. They were milling about separately. Mott felt a growl-like sound rise up in his throat. The little monsters, they were messing with him. You're so easy to mess with, a chorus of whispers tickled his ears. Mott clamped his, ears, his hands over his ears and started humming. He wasn't sure how long he stood there humming, probably not long. Rory was capable of sitting still for only a nanosecond or so. He couldn't have been waiting at his desk for a long before he started yanking on Mott's shirt. Mott opened his eyes and he looked at his brother. What, Rory? What's a word that rhymes with love? Above? Dove? Mott chewed the inside of his cheek. That's all I can think of right now. Above works. Stupid. The whispers came in. I need to go to the bathroom, Mott told Rory. Stay in here and behave. When you're done with your poem, come and get me in my room. But... Rory began. Mott didn't wait. He bolted down the hall and escaped into the bathroom. He wasn't sure how long he remained in the small, white-tiled room. He didn't need to use the toilet, so he sat on the edge of the tub and stared at the fish-patterned blue and white wallpaper. He shivered. Was it fish in general that were weirding him out now? He gazed at the wallpaper. Would the blue fish whisper at him too? He waited. Nope. No whispers. That was because the sounds weren't in his head. Or at least, they weren't being manufactured in his head. The sounds were coming from the sea bonnies. He was sure of it. Mott? Rory shouted through the door. He pounded on the door so hard it rattled in his frame. I'm ready. Mott sighed and stood. Taking a deep breath, he opened the door. Come look, Rory said. He motioned for Mott to follow him back to his bedroom. I said you can read it in my room, Mott said. Rory turned and shook his head. No, you have to come see this. It's it's super duper coolio. Mott swallowed and accompanied Rory. In Rory's room, Rory walked over to the fish tank and began reading. When I saw my sea bonnies, I fell in love. It was like a gift from Freddy above. They're super cool and they make me glad. I like that because I hate being sad. Rory pointed to the sea bonnies and looked over at Mott with a face shining with happiness. See, he said. They like it. Mott made himself look in the tank. Oh man. As much as the sea bonnies seemed to dislike Mott, they appeared to love Rory. They were all in formation again, lined up at the glass in front of Mott's little brother. Their little see-through tails were shimmying in unison. Well, at least the revolting little monsters are nice to my brother, Mott thought. It's a good poem, Mott said to Rory. Rory turned to beam at him. Behind Rory, the sea bonnies darted as one to the end of the aquarium and they all focused on Mott, 
or again, it looked like they did. Do you want to, uh, sorry, do you want to come play my video game with me? Mot asked R uh, Rory. Really? Sure. Mot Rory ran toward Mott, his sea bodies and his poem momentarily forgotten. Mott hummed as he and Rory trotted toward the stairs. Behind him, whispers reached for his ears, but he hummed louder and refused to listen. Mott managed to avoid his brother's room for the rest of the evening. When his mother got home, he told her Rory had been restless, so Mott hadn't had time to do his homework. She took over Rory duty, and Mott retreated to his room. Because, distressingly, he could still hear the faintest of whispers in his own room, he put in his earbuds and listened to music while he studied. He kept in the earbuds while he got ready for bed, taking them out only for a couple of minutes to say goodnight to his mum. Then he went to bed wearing the earbuds. When he got up the next morning, he went from earbuds to shower to earbuds to out the door. He, avoid, he avoided breakfast by telling his mum he had to get to school early to meet with Nate and Lyle so they could talk about an upcoming history project. The truth was the history project was weeks away, but he figured a lie in the interest of remaining sane was a lie worth telling. Over lunch, sitting with his friends, eating his cheese sandwich, he thought about telling them what was going on, but he knew his friends. They didn't share more than one serious bone between them. Mostly, they were one big laugh fest. There was no way they'd do anything but make fun of Mott if he told them what he thought about the sea bodies. After algebra that afternoon, he briefly considered telling Teresa about his experience with the sea bonnies. He knew she was grossed out, as grossed out by them as he was, so she might be inclined to believe him. But, maybe next weekend, she asked him. Mott realised he'd missed all of whatever she just told him. I'm so sorry, he said. My head was someplace else. Teresa laughed. I do that all the time. I said we're going camping this weekend, but I was wondering if you'd like to get together next weekend and study. I'm having trouble with two variable linear equations. You seem to be getting it. I was hoping you could help me. Bro, this, this, this isn't that difficult. <laughs> two variable linear equations? Bro, you're not even at three variable yet. Okay. <laughs> I'm just nerding out, sorry. She looked really pretty today. Her shiny hair was caught back in a yellow scarf that matched her short dress. Mott grinned. Sure, he'd help her shovel manure, if she asked. He didn't think telling a pretty girl that you think tiny mutant brine shrimp were whispering to you was a good way to impress her. He kept his fears to himself. If only he could stay away from home. But he couldn't. His mum was used to him be enjoying uh, being at home. He spent most of his afternoons with Rory and most of his evenings with his mum when she wasn't at an event. She'd find it bizarre if he suddenly wanted to stay over with Nate or Lyle, and his friends would too. He'd just have to avoid Rory's room. This plan worked much for the evening. He got Rory involved in another video game in the living room. Then he suggested they all play a board game after dinner. When the game concluded, Mott started to tell his mum he had a headache. Unfortunately, she beat him to it. Can you get Rory ready for bed, Mott? His mum held a palm to the side of her head. I have a tension headache and I need to lie down. Ooh. See, I... I'm a little bit upset with this story so far. No, like, the, the story's really, really good. But I'm upset if, uh... If Mott actually, like, gets... Gets, uh... Killed or something off by, by this story. Because nothing... He hasn't done anything bad to deserve anything. Like, he's... He's a nice person. He clearly has a good relationship with his mother and his brother. He seems to have good friends, and he has a he has a crush, obviously, who he speaks nicely to. He hasn't done anything wrong. Obviously, he's like the perfect human being, so I guess he needs to like lower his ego a bit. I don't know. It's kind of weird that that Mott is targeted here. Anyway, let's see where this goes, because it might not even be Mott. Who knows? Mott's reluctance must have shown on his face. She frowned when she looked at him and said, I'll give you extra allowance this week. Mott shook his head. Forget that. It's okay. Sorry, I was just... Never mind. Of course, I'll get him to bed. Let's read Foxy and Bonnie on the high seas, Rory shouted. Mott's mum drew away from the sound and headed out of the room. Dial it down, buddy, Mott said. Mama has a headache. Oh. Rory turned to watch their mum go up the stairs. Sorry, mum, he yelled. Mott shook his head and ruffled Rory's hair. Rory emitted his multisyllabic Mott and galloped up the stairs. 
Mott turned off all the lights, checked that all the doors were locked and the security system was on, and then he followed his brother up to the second floor. A long 20 minutes later, Mott had Rory settled and in bed. You need to get sleep, Mott told to his brother. He handed Rory the plush Freddy Fazbear he liked to sleep with. Nope, Rory said. Read. He clutched Freddy and pointed to his nightstand. The book he'd referred to, the, he'd referred to earlier was lying under a rolled up comic book, a slingshot and a half empty package of gum. Yeah, read, the whispers commanded. Mott ground his teeth, but he reached for the book. He knew better than to try to leave Rory's room without reading to him. Rory was quite capable of pitching an ear-splitting fit, and if he did that, it would delay Mott's exit from the room even longer. So he reached for the book and pulled it out, sending the slingshot and the gum to the floor. He didn't bother to pick them up, he just started reading where he'd last left off. He read fast and he read loudly, but Rory didn't seem to care. He listened raptly for several minutes, and then his eyes began to droop. Mott kept reading loudly. He was almost shouting. Just as he had been with all his silly antics earlier, he was trying to drown out the whispers. Thankfully, Rory could sleep through a hurricane. He burrowed down under the covers, tucked Freddy under his chin, and closed his eyes tightly. In seconds, Mott could hear Rory's little kid snores, even over the shouted reading. Mott stopped reading, laid the book on the nightstand and stood all in one motion. He was ready to get out of here. He turned off the wagon wheel lamp on the nightstand but the room didn't go dark. Rory had a nightlight plugged in near his door and the fish tank had a light which was still on. Mott turned and prepared to sprint out of the room. Nambi Pambi, the whispers taunted. Mott froze. Feeling like he couldn't back down from a challenge made by something as small as a sea bonny, he turned to glare at the hideous things, expecting them to see him expecting to see him glaring eh, expecting to see them glaring back at him. He was surprised to find them all clustered together near the back of the tank. He started to walk by, but then he did a double take. They weren't just clustered together, they were clustered together around Fritz. They were attacking him. Mott made a beeline for the fish tank to save Fritz but he realised there was nothing he could do without a net. He looked around wildly. Where was the net that he used to remove Fritz when he had to clean the fish tank? Mott started opening Rory's desk drawers and then he snapped his fingers. Rory had taken the thing into the bathroom. He'd been playing with it in the tub. Mott tore out of Rory's room. He raced down the hall to the bathroom. Yep, there was the net, sitting on the side of the tub. Grabbing it, Mott ran back into Rory's room. He charged over to the fish tank. As Mott reached for the tank's lid, he froze. The sea bonnies were nowhere near Fritz. They were swimming around in the tank, acting like, well, acting like normal sea bonnies. And Fritz was swimming around by himself. He looked just fine. Had Mott imagined what he'd seen? Mott to lean closer to be sure Fritz was okay. He appeared to be. Mott blinked and drowned. Drowned? Frowned. <laughs> Fritz was not okay. Fritz was different. He didn't appear to be orange anymore. What had the sea bonnies done to him? Ignoring his distaste for the sea bonnies, Mott went over to the tank to get a closer look at the goldfish. Up close, it was clear that not only was Fritz's colour off, his shape was weird too. Now a faded blue, not unlike the colour of the sea bonnies. Fritz was a little lumpy, as if he'd... No, hang on. He wasn't lumpy. Mott gasped, but he couldn't pull himself away from the tank. He had to see. He leaned closer, putting his face almost up to the glass. Fritz was drifting lazily through a cluster of sea bonnies toward the back of the tank. Mott had to wait until Fritz turned to circle toward the front of the tank. He remained still, almost holding his breath, as the no longer goldfish came to his way. As soon as Fritz swam toward the front wall of the tank, Mott's stomach turned. He covered his mouth as he stared at the fish. Mott had been right where he'd first seen it. Um... Yeah... Fritz wasn't just lumpy, something was moving inside Fritz. No, not inside. Mott squinted at the fish as it swam past his gaze. Something was moving on the outside too. All of Fritz was in motion, as if... Oh, gross! Mott backed away from the tank, but he couldn't stop looking at Fritz. Not that Fritz was Fritz anymore. Fritz was no longer a goldfish. He no longer had fish scales and fins. No. Fritz was now... Fritz was now a mass of squirming sea bonnies. 
all Fritz's own parts have been replaced with the tiny, gelatinous, deformed, aquatic rabbits. Wow. Wow, that's cool. I feel like that's kind of like the ship of Theseus right there. You know, you know, if you like replace all the planks on a ship, is it still the same ship? And if you use the old planks to build a new ship, is it still the same ship? I feel like that's what it was going for, because he was like, uh, uh, where, where is it? Uh, not that Fritz was Fritz anymore. That's, that's kind of like the, his judgment on it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Mott stared in belief and total disgust. As he gaped, he saw a couple of Fritz's scales drifting toward the bottom of the tank. They slowly floated downward until they settled on the rocks. Mott stared at the tiny scales. They were all that was left of the original Fritz. Mott felt like he was going to be sick. Fritz swam behind a cluster of sea bonnies and Mott swallowed bile. He made a face and started to turn toward the door, but movement in the tank caught his attention. He glanced back. All the sea bonnies were lined up against the glass, staring at him. Mott ran from Rory's room. Mott spent most of the night and, most, and the better part of the next day thinking about Fritz. Or actually, not Fritz. All this time, all this thinking time wasn't technically needed because he'd reached a conclusion about the body snatched fish within the hour of leaving Roy's room. Lying on his back on his bed, he'd forced himself to think about what he'd seen. After analysing it from every angle he could think of, he decided what he'd seen was not some new version of Fritz formed out of sea bodies. It was, instead, a Fritz imposter. <laughs> it was a mass of sea bonnies formed to look like Fritz. That's kind of sus. Why? Because the sea bonnies had consumed Fritz, then used what they'd ingested to multiply themselves and take Fritz's place. Mott had decided they were kind of like flesh-eating nanobots, which then took on the form of the thing they'd eaten. Huh. <laughs> a little bit like Fazgu. <laughs> Uh, and imagine, can you imagine? They wait. That is that is kind of a good description. They take on the form of the thing they'd eaten. That is kind of a good description of Fazgu. Anyway, I don't know. I don't think it will be Fazgu, but anyway. The day after Mott saw not Fritz for the first time, the day was bright and relentlessly sunny. The weather was all wrong for his mood. He thought a stormy day would have better suited his dark thoughts. But no matter, his thoughts weren't distracted by the sunshine. By the time Mott got home from school, he'd reached a conclusion. The sea bonnies had to go. Unfortunately, he came to this conclusion too late in the day. If he'd worked this out earlier, he could have cut school to come home and flush the nasty things. But now Rory was home, and Mott was going to have to figure out a way to get Rory out of his room. No, out of the house, so Mott could dispose of the sea bonnies. Rory now sat at the kitchen counter eating his after-school snack of crackers, cheese and orange juice. Mott leaned against the counter by the sink and watched his brother shower crumbs all over his blue shirt and the floor. How about we go outside and toss the ball around, Mott said. It's a nice day, everyone should be outside. Okay, Rory shouted. I'll go get my mitt. Shoving his last two crackers into his mouth and trailing crumbs behind him, he scurried out of the kitchen. Once they were outside, Mott started working on a plan to keep Rory out of the house while Mott went back inside and disposed of the sea bonnies. Mott had plenty of time to work on his plan because neither he nor Rory were particularly good at throwing or catching. A lot of the time was spent running around their big backyard, chasing the ball. Mott's house sat on a large lot, which backed up on a green belt. A thick forest of old oak and maple trees hugged the fence line and gnarled branches reached into the yard to drop leaves. Uneven grass covered most of the yard. It used to be thick green grass, but when Mott's dad started taking longer flights, which kept him away longer, he stopped doing things like fertilising and trimming. Moles started burrowing under the lawn, and the yard turned lumpy, sort of like not Fritz. Mott squinted up at the sun, which was starting to slide toward the horizon. He needed an excuse soon to keep Rory outside. Hey, Rory, a child's voice called from the other side of the wooden fence at the north end of the yard. Hey, Danny, Rory called back. He'd been running after the ball, but he abandoned that task and veered toward the wood slats that uh, separated Rory's domain from Dan Danny's. Wanna come play ball? Rory shouted. He put his face up to one of the weathered fence boards and peered through a knot hole. Nope, Danny called. 
Mum and I are taking the pup for his first walk on a leash. Wanna come? Yeah, Rory shouted. He turned to look at Mott. Can we? He yelled. He did a typical Rory spastic dance of excitement. Mott grinned. This is perfect, he nodded. You go ahead. I'll stay here and get started on my homework so I'll have more time to play with you later. Cool, Rory shouted. He dropped his mitt and ran toward the gate. I'll keep an eye on them, Danny's mother. Oh, that was his mother. I'll keep an eye on them, Danny's mother called through his feints. Thanks, Mrs. Fairchild. Mott charged back into the house as soon as Rory slammed the gate shut and started shouting, What's up, the pup? Mott had a feeling of walk that included a puppy and two anst antsy boys. It wasn't going to be a long one. He needed to hurry. He took the stairs two at a time and ran down the hall to Rory's room. Rory's door was open. It always was during the day. Inside the room, Mott went directly to Rory's desk, shoved aside a pile of books and reached for the fish tank. The sound of splashing water stopped him. He looked in the tank. Its lid was up, probably because Rory had forgotten to close it after he fed his little manic, manic, maniacal creatures. Mott could see both through the glass and from above the water that the sea bonnies were spun up, violently darting this way and that, creating swirls under the water and rough waves on the top. It was as, it was if they knew what he planned to do. Oh, it was if they knew what he planned to do. Yeah, well, so what? He wasn't going to have to be worried about what they knew and what they didn't know soon enough. Mott strode to the desk, reached out and slapped the fish tank lid closed. The water inside the tank churned more wildly. The lid vibrated like it was going to pop open. Mott smacked his hand down on top of it, then used his other hand to put a book on the lid. He looked around and grabbed one of Rory's t-shirts off the floor, covering the tank with the shirt, because he sure didn't want to look at the sea bonnies as he carried them to their deaths. He pulled the tank book toward him and lifted it off the desk. The sound of frothing water got louder. He ignored it. The fish tank was a lot heavier than he expected it to be, but he was strong enough to carry it, barely. From this point, he had to go slowly. He walked methodically and steadily toward the bathroom, and when he got there, he set the fish tank on the counter. He flipped on the light and closed the bathroom door. The toilet seat lid opened with a squeak. Mott turned toward the fish tank. He had to take the t-shirt and the book off the tank now. He wished he had rubber gloves. He didn't want a single drop of the water in the fish tank to touch him. Well, he'd just have to be careful. Mott took off the fish tank's lid, inspected it for errant sea bonnies, found none, and set it aside. Then, he ever so carefully began pouring the fish tank's water and the sea bonnies into the toilet bowl. He half expected to hear whispering as he poured. Would the sea bonnies beg for their lives? Would they try to make him feel guilty or murderous? He heard nothing. Maybe they were in shock. It was a good thing they didn't try to make him feel bad because he felt no regret. What he felt was relief. Deep and profound relief. He couldn't empty the entire fish tank into the toilet bowl at once, so he started by pouring as much of the water out as he could. While he poured, he flushed. Once he had most of the water gone, he was able to flush the bulk of the sea bonnies together. Then it took one last spill to dump the last of the sea bonnies and pour not Fritz into the bowl. He watched the remaining sea bodies and not Fritz whirl around the toilet bowl, and as soon as they disappeared and clear water refilled the bowl, he did a fist pump. Yes, he shouted. He looked inside the fish tank to be sure all the sea bodies were gone. They weren't. One purplish creature was flopping around in the bottom of the tank. Mott quickly held the fish tank under the bathtub faucet. He let out about an inch of water. He, oh, sorry, he let about an inch of water run into the tank, and he swished it around. Then he dumped this water too. He flushed it again. Check the sea tank. No sea bonnies. Uh, fish tank, sorry. No sea bonnies. Uh, moving fast again, Mott grabbed a roll of paper towels from under the sink. He also ran down to the kitchen to get his mum's big stock pot. It had occurred to him, while he was watching the sea bonnies head off to their sewery grave, that he should have, have a plausible story for why he'd flushed his brother's friends. He'd quickly come up with one. He was going to make it look like he'd been trying to clean the tank and when he transferred them to the pot they died, perhaps poisoned by the stainless steel? That should work. Rory didn't know any better. 
his mum probably wouldn't either, and she wouldn't care much. She had other things to think about. Even if Rory pitched a fit and went running to his mummy, his mum wouldn't suspect Mott of deliberately disposing of the sea bodies. She'd just soothe Rory's hurt feelings, and that would be that. Which was almost what happened. The only part of that scenario that didn't the scenario that didn't play out, according to Mott's plan, was Rory's reaction. Rory didn't pitch a fit. He didn't throw a tantrum. He didn't go running to his mummy. Instead, he burst into tears, ran into his room, slammed the door and locked it. Okay, so maybe Mott felt a little bad. He loved his brother and he didn't want to upset the little guy. Had there been some other way to handle the situation? Mott stood outside his brother's door asking himself this question as he tried to get Rory to come downstairs for dinner. I'm really sorry, Bunny. Bud, sorry. I'm really sorry, buddy. He called through the closed door. I was only trying to help. This much was true. He'd been trying to help himself be free of the sea bodies, for sure. But he also didn't like them being in the same room as his little brother. After all, the loathsome things did chow down on Fritz. They might be dangerous. What if they bit Rory and gave him an infection? Mum wants you to come down for dinner, Mott called through the closed door. Go away, Rory yelled. I'm not here. Um, okay, Mott said. Then who's yelling at me? Not me, Rory shouted. A chill skittered down Mott's spine. Not me was way too close to not Fritz. The image of a sea bonny infested Rory flashed through Mott's mind. He shuddered and stepped back from the door. Suit yourself, he called. Maybe this is Fazgu. There's no way. There's no... What? They, they, no, this can't be Fazgu. I, 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 I don't think this is Fazgu. But there's there's a sliv sliver of me that believes that this is Fazgu. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Wow. Uh, this is this is this is very good. And also, I see a lot of parallels to the Crying Child and Foxy Bro. Obviously, Mott fell into bed just before 10 p.m. Exhausted. Not only had he slept very little the night before, he tapped out his energy with all the thinking he'd done during the day. The adrenaline rush of vanquishing his enemies and the struggle to get Rory to open the bedroom door. The latter part of Mott's tough day had stretched through the evening. Neither his nor his mum's powers of persuasion had been enough to get Rory to open his door. Eventually, it was Rory's need to pee that got his door open. When he finally came out and emptied his bladder, he made two announcements. To his mum, he announced, I'm hungry. I bet you are, she said. That's what happens when you refuse to open your door. She pulled him close. Why don't you come and climb in bed with me and you can explain to me what, why you did what you did. And I can explain to you why you don't get to do it anymore. If we're both satisfied at the end of the conversation, I'll fix you a snack. Deal? Rory wiped red eyes and nodded. He then turned to Mott and announced, You're not my brother. Rory, his mum admonished. It's okay, mum, Mott said. I get it. To Rory, he said, I really am sorry. That was only part of a lie. He wasn't sorry he'd flushed the sea bonnies, but he was sorry that Rory was upset. Now Mott lay in the silent house and wondered if Rory had fallen asleep. Rory had still been crying when their mum had put him to bed. The house creaked, and outside an owl hooted. Mott turned on his side and looked at his curtain-covered window. His window looked out over the green belt behind the house, and it was right over the roof that covered the back deck. In the summer, he liked to climb out onto that roof and sit in the sun, watching the birds in the trees. It was so peaceful. Mott closed his eyes. He realised he was relaxed for the first time since he'd seen the sea bonnies in Rory's tank. He exhaled and went to sleep. As soon as he did, he dropped into a dream. Mott sat at the breakfast table, eating his cornflakes and reading the last of his English literature assignment, shoveling in his food, keeping an eye on the pages of his book. He spooned up milk and flakes over and over. As he neared the bottom of the bowl, though, he shifted his gaze from the book to the cereal, and that's when he saw them. Instead of seeing flakes floating in his milk, Mott saw sea bonnies swimming in formation around his bowl, their squidgy, bluish bodies disgustingly pulsing through the milk. The sea bonnies flipped over and looked up at him with itty-bitty black beady eyes. Wow. <laughs> Mott yelled, gagged, and shoved the bowl away from him. No! Mott's yell followed him out of his dream and into his waking state. He thrashed free of his covers 
and sat up. The hair on his arms was sticking out, and his heart was pounding hard and fast and loud in his chest. He felt a dry heave come up. He swallowed it down. He started to retch, and he sprang out of his bed and rushed to the bathroom. Afraid his cry might have pulled his mum from a deep sleep, Mott didn't turn on the bathroom light. He didn't want her to worry. He groped in the dark for the glass he knew was next to the sink, ran tap water into the glass, and started chugging it down. No, it's got the thingies in it! It's got the sea bodies in it! Halfway through the glass, the water going down Mott's throat suddenly felt clumpy. No, like it had thickened, or it suddenly had something in it, like a glob of noodles in a bowl of chicken soup. Choking and sputtering, he dropped the glass as he reached for the light. The light came on just as the glass landed in the sink and cracked. Mott quickly shut the bathroom door and scooped up the glass to examine it closely. Holding the glass up to the light, he inspected the water droplets caught on the inside of the curve. Was anything swimming in the drops? He also studied the crack. Was anything caught in it? He saw nothing but water. Oh my god. This is either all in his head again. Uh, a bit like Blackbird. Or it is actually happening. <laughs> and this is crazy. Okay. Wow. I like this a lot. Sitting on the closed toilet seat, he thought about what he'd felt in his throat. Had he really felt something, or had he just swallowed wrong? Maybe there had been some toothpaste in the glass, or maybe his mind had conjured up the sensation because of his dream. Given what he'd done that day, it was easy to assume he'd imagined feeling something slimy slip down his throat. As freaking as, as freaked out as he was by the sea bonnies, it was surprising that he could even think about drinking water. Mott picked up the cracked glass and looked at it again. Nope, still nothing. Mott blew out a sigh and headed back into his room. When he opened his eyes the next morning, Mott's logic fa faced its first foe. His stomach was cramping so badly he could barely get out of bed and go to the bathroom to pee. And when he was done with that, it was all he could do to get back into the bed, curl onto his side, clutch his stomach and moan. This is Pizza Kit, number two. <laughs> the sequel. That's where his mother found him when she came in to be sure he was up. Rise and shine, she called out. It's, uh, Mott? She rushed to the side of the bed. What's wrong? She felt his forehead. Mott hesitated. I'm not sure. I have stomach cramps, like big ones. I must have eaten something bad last night. His mum frowned at him. What did you eat that we didn't eat? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Mott thought. All I had yesterday was what you made me for lunch and what we had for dinner. As far as food went, that was the truth. He wasn't about to tell her thi uh, about thinking he'd swallowed a sea bonnie. That opened a can of worms, or sea bonnies, ha, he didn't want to get into. I'll go get something for your stomach, his mum said, and I'll check on Rory to be sure he's okay. Maybe he's sick too. That's why he was so upset about his sea bonnies last night. Mott opened his mouth to respond, but another wave of cramping gripped his intestines. And right on the heels of that, the whispers returned. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Whiss. The little whispers flung at him. Can't handle swallowing just one? What do you think a hundred would feel like? Two hundred? Two thousand? The whispers morphed into what sounded like hushed giggles. Oh my god. Thousands of them. Mott closed his eyes and pressed his lips together. I'll be right back, his mum said. He heard his mum's foot taps, uh, footfalls tap across the floor. She was already dressed for work, wearing her high heels. She must have an event today. And here he was, making trouble for her. Mott tried to concentrate on his breathing, but between the cramping and the whispers, he couldn't stay focused on it. He couldn't decide which was worse, the horrible cramping or the eerie and relentless whispers. Serves you right, the whispers were saying now. Every bad deed gets punished. Mott's mum reappeared with the chalky medicine she always gave him when his stomach was upset. Rory's fine, she said, pouring Mott a dose. He swallowed it dutifully. But he had a peanut butter sandwich yesterday, his mum said. I gave you the rest of the lunch meat. It must have gone bad. I'm so, so sorry, honey. It's not your fault, mum, he said, absolutely meaning it. He had no doubt what, whatsoever that the way he felt had nothing to do with bad m lunch meat. It had to do with what had gone down his throat last night. He was sure of it. Convincing himself he'd swallowed Rory's toothpaste had been wishful thinking. You're not as stupid as you look, the whispering voices said. Mott looked up at his mum. I think I just need to go back to sleep. Maybe when I wake up I'll feel better. He was lying now to both himself and his mum. Are you sure? I could, she chewed on her lower lip, have someone else run the event. No mum, you don't need to do that. I'll be fine. 
she felt his forehead again. You're not hot. In fact, you're kind of on the cool side. Chocolate milk, Rory shouted from the hallway. I want chocolate milk for breakfast. Mort cringed at the volume. His mum gave him a half smile. Well, apparently he's gotten over his upset. Good, Mott said. Mum, Rory yelled. I'm coming, she called. She looked at Mott one more time. You're sure you... I'll be fine, he lied again. He wasn't at all sure if he was going to be fine. The cramps were starting to feel more intense and the voices were getting more insistent. The whispering wasn't a unison murmur anymore. It was more like the garbled hissing of hundreds of voices all muttering at once. He could no longer make out a whole phrase, but he caught a word here and there. Stupid was used frequently. He also heard guilty and murderer a few times. What? Once he was sure he heard milk sob. What? Oh no. We're going to we're going it's going to be revealed that he's a murderer. And that's why they're doing this to him. Because uh, before I was saying about them having the problem, uh, about the story having the problem, that the guy doesn't deserve any of this. But he's going to be revealed to be a murderer. It's, it's like what we found, and that kind of like reveal in that sense. Oh my god. If that is where this story is going, this story could be one of the best stories out of the, out of the, out of the entire series, I think. Did you hear me? His mum asked. What? Mott curled up tighter as a new spasm clutched at his belly. I said that if you don't feel better when you wake up, be sure to call Ron. I'm going to go get on the phone with him before I leave and tell him you may be needing him. Ron was Dr. T. That was actually a good idea. Mott said so and then he closed his mouth on the groan that wanted to erupt into the room. In the hallway, Rory shouted, I'm starving! His mum leaned over and kissed Mott on the forehead. Sleep, honey. You'll feel better soon. She, closed, she crossed to the door, gave him one last look, and left the room. He heard her talking softly to Rory in the hallway. Then he heard Rory's footsteps pounding down the stairs and his mum's tapping heels after that. Mott closed his eyes and tried to sleep. Tried, being the op operative word. When Mott looked at his bedside digital clock for the 761st time, okay, maybe he hadn't quite looked quite that many times, but close, at 1.37 in the afternoon, precisely he gave up trying to convince himself he was going to feel better soon. It just wasn't going to happen. At 1.38, he got up and went to the bathroom. He thought maybe if he could use the toilet, he'd feel better. Five minutes later, he was back in his bedroom and he wasn't feeling better. Moaning, he changed into sweats, a t-shirt and some athletic shoes. He called Dr. T's clinic. Claudia, Dr. T's receptionist, answered. Mott could picture her holding the phone as they spoke. Large and cushy with wildly curly hair and kind hazel eyes, Claudia was a caring woman Mott had known as long as he'd known Dr. T. She immediately put Dr. T on the phone. Can you get over here on your own? Dr. T asked. I think I can bike over. Uh, Mott struggled to get out. His hesitations weren't entirely caused by stomach cramps. The whispers were getting louder, and they were as distracting as all get out. What he was hearing sounded kind of like someone quickly scanning through radio, st radio stations. However, he was hearing snatches of words and phrases instead of snatches of songs. None of them were anything he wanted to listen to. In about 15 minutes, Dr. T said. I'm sorry, what? I said your voice and your hesitations aren't giving me a lot of confidence in your biking abilities. Claudia's going on a lunch break and she said she'll, she'll swing over to get you. She'll be there in about 15 minutes. Oh, I don't want to. Don't argue with your doctor, Dr. T said. He chuckled. Mott sighed. Thank you. One of the voices whispered, Sucker. Dr. T had exam rooms des designed to please the various age groups he focused on. He had some for the little kids, the grade school kids, and the teens. Unfortunately, because Dr. T was squeezing in Mott between other patients, Mott landed in a little kid room. So, when he lay on his back, he was staring up at a ceiling painted with sparkly rainbows, flying purple pigs, and a blue-tinged pegasus that at the moment resembled a sea bunny far as it should have. It must have been the wings, which look vaguely like bunny ears. And that purplish-blue colour. He never really wanted to see that colour again. 
Mott quickly looked away from the ceiling, turning his head to gaze at the room's walls. They were painted yellow and covered with animal stencils. Pretty much every imaginable animal had a spot in the room, including a rabbit, which Mott could have sworn was staring at him with animosity. Mott closed his eyes. The paper beneath him crinkled as he shifted to find a semi-comfortable position while Dr. T prodded his belly. Every time Dr. T asked, Does this hurt? Mott gasped, Yes. Dr. T stepped back and sat on his rolling stool. Mott heard the vinyl squeak and the rollers rattle as Dr. T scooted over to the laptop he'd set up at a small counter next to the exam table. Dr. T was kind of a funny looking guy. This was mostly caused by his big ears and his equally large nose, but a goatee that came to the point under his chin contributed too. On top... Uh, wait, sorry. There's this weird formatting... Uh, on top of these eye-catching features, he was short and totally bald. When Mott and Nate were ten, Dr. T had shaved what little remained of his light brown hair. He looked a bit like one of the seven dwarfs, or maybe a gnome. He might have been nice, one of the nicest people Mott had ever met, though, even nicer than Mott's mum. His mum occasionally lost a temper. Dr. T never did. Mott tried to concentrate on how nice Dr. T was, but the whispered voices got louder. He was now hearing more full sentences. You don't know what you're dealing with, for example, came through clearly. Mott tried to keep his breathing steady while he watched Dr. T type. I just realised, Mott isn't a murderer. He, he just threw the... I'm such an idiot. He just threw the sea bonnies down the toilet. He flushed the sea bonnies and they're calling him a murderer for it. Ah... Uh, I would have absolutely loved this story if it was revealed that he was a murderer. Damn it. Mott tried to keep his breathing steady while he watched Dr. T type. He felt sweat trickle down between his shoulder blades and he squirmed. He was attempting to stay calm but these cramps and the relentless whispers were terrifying. What was happening inside his body? Mott abruptly rose up on an elbow. He glanced at his belly and he frowned. Did his belly look lumpy? He thought it did. Okay. Dr. T said. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to get Louise in here to draw some blood. The blood test will tell me if you have an infection. When she's done with that, Louise will also do an ultrasound. That will tell me if we're looking at a gallbladder issue, which is a possibility. Mott nodded. He didn't bother any... He, put, he didn't bother to ask questions about his gallbladder. He pointed at his belly. Do you think my stomach looks lumpy? I think it looks lumpy. Dr. T stood and looked down at Mott's stomach. It looks normal to me and I didn't feel any masses. Mott frowned. Okay. Dr. T patted Mott's thigh. When you feel like crap, it's easy for the mind to start imagining all kinds of worst case scenarios. So let's start with the treatment right away, even while we get the test set up. What treatment? Dr. T flipped his computer screen, turning it into a tablet. He tapped the screen and handed it to Mott. Watch this. Louise will be here in a few minutes to draw blood and do the ultrasound. Dr. T pressed a button and the upper part of the table Mott lay on raised a little. That work? Mott nodded. He took the tablet. Dr. T patted his leg again. I'll be back after I look, after your, look at your tests. In the meantime, he pointed at the tablet screen Mott held. Watch that. Dr. T strode from the room, closing the door behind him. Mott cringing at another round of cramping looked at the screen. It was frozen on a video of a stand-up comic routine. He managed a half smile and shook his head. Leave it to Dr. T to prescribe laughter. Maybe the laughter helped. Mott had been tempted to set aside Dr. T's tablet and just be miserable while he waited for Louise. But two more intense cramps and a whispered your time is coming got him to hit play on the screen. He hadn't heard of the comedian in the video, but he was really funny. Mott managed to chuckle at first, and then he was actually laughing so hard that Louise, a small dark-haired woman in a ponytail, had to pause the video while she took blood. She let him watch again while she did the ultrasound, which she did silently. After a few minutes of feeling her pressing the magic wand, as she called it, over his stomach, Mott asked, Do you see anything? I don't, kiddo, she said. But we'll have Dr. T come in and give a look-see to be sure. The look-see came quickly. Dr. T studied the scan and grinned at Mott. Everything looks normal. Really? Mott frowned. Then why do I feel so bad? Honestly, I'm not 100% sure, but uh, my guess is that you have food poisoning. I'll know more when I get your blood work, but nothing horrible is going on. 
Mott nodded. Okay. Dr. T squeezed his shoulder. Your enthusiasm is overwhelming, he chuckled. How about this? Why don't you go get dressed and you hang out on the sofa in my office? I have a couple more patients to see. Then I'm heading home. I'll give you a ride. Mott nodded again. When Dr. T and Louise left the room, Mott sat up on the edge of the exam table and took in what Dr. T had said. He tried believing it. You're fine, he told himself out loud. Liar, liar, pants on fire, the whispers countered. Oh, wow, this is really good. Mott shook his head and stood up to get dressed. You're not real, he said to the whispers. I'm fine. Although he could have sworn that he heard sibilant laughter in his head, Mott ignored it and got dressed. Strangely, the cramping had abated a little. Maybe it was the laughter, but it was more likely the power of suggestion. He was comforted by the, the results of the ultrasound. If something foreign had been in his belly, the scan would have found it. Right? Right. Mott was able to walk Sammy normally down the clinic's hallway, behind the purple and white striped door of exam room 2, near Dr. T's office, a little girl giggled. Mott smiled. It was a nice sound, much nicer than the poisonous murmurs in his head. He pushed open the door of Dr. T's office and dropped onto Dr. T's overstuffed blue and yellow polka dot couch. Listening to the continued giggling, he fell asleep. He woke only long enough to uh, only long enough for Dr. T to walk him out to Dr. T's new SUV and get him home. Then he went up to his bed and he fell back asleep. When Mott woke up, it was dark, but the dark wasn't nighttime dark, it was pre-dawn dark. He sat up. He'd slept for over 12 hours. Taking shock, he realised he felt okay. His stomach was sore, but he wasn't cramping like before. The whispers were still in his head, but they seemed muted. Fumbling for his small bedside lamp, Mott switched it on. As soon as the light poured onto his nightstand, he saw a bottle of water, several crackers in a plastic bag, and a note. He picked up the note. Mott, you were sleeping soundly, and Ron said that the best... That was the best thing for you, so I didn't wake you. I've left you some crackers in case you want to wake... Unless you wake a cup hungry. If you need me, come and get me. I love you, Mom. Mott smiled and reached for the bottled water. He was really thirsty, so he quickly unscrewed the lid. He started to bring the bottle to his lips, but then he stopped. He held the bottle under the glow of his lamp, and he studied it. He rolled his eyes. It was just water. Bottled water in a sealed container. It was fine. He drank some water and he reached for the crackers. Leaning back on his pillows, he opened the plastic bag and plucked out a whole wheat cracker. Munching on it, he looked around his semi-dark room, at the nature posters and photos of his favourite baseball stadiums, at the shelves full of video games and math puzzle books, at the closet he knew was stuffed with his clothes and hiking and fishing gear. He took comfort in being reminded of who he was. He wasn't Mott, a boy infested by sea bonnies. He was Mott, lover of baseball and video games and math and camping out, best friend to Nate and Lyle, a good brother to Rory, and maybe soon to be boyfriend to Teresa. He was a normal teen. You're a freak, the whispers countered. Yeah, and you're not real, he told them. In the light of this new day, it felt even more true. He shook his head. Sea bonnies couldn't even hatch without purified water above 75 degrees. How are they going to survive his stomach acid? He chuckled as he kept munching on crackers and looking around his room. Over Mott's desk, opposite his bed, he had a dark green bulletin board covered in photos. The photos represented his favourite things and best memories. The one in the middle was a picture of him and his dad sitting in a rowboat in the middle of the lake where his family had a summer cabin. His dad always got a couple weeks off in July, and they went to the cabin to swim and hike and fish. Mott usually felt disconnected from his dad, but when they fished, he felt close to... F fish. <laughs> Mott dropped his half-eaten cracker and sat up. His reminiscing had reminded him of Fritz, the fish that was no longer a fish, when Mott flushed it down the toilet with the sea bonnies. He hadn't imagined the way not Fritz had looked when Mott had last seen him. He might have been imagining the whispers, but he'd seen what he'd seen. Fritz had been eaten from the inside out and replaced by sea bonnies. He was pretty sure fish had stomach acid too, and yet the sea bonnies had still managed to get him. Oh, shoot. 
Uh, Mott looked down at his belly. Setting aside the plate, he raised his shirt with a trembling hand. He put his palm against the skin. It was normal, wasn't it? Mott thought about how horrible he'd felt before and after and how he felt now. He'd assumed the end of the cramps were a good thing. But what if all that meant that... What if all that meant was that the sea bonnies had finished their work on his stomach? Maybe he felt better because his belly was no longer being consumed. It was now something else. His not belly. <laughs> Mott gingerly felt all over his stomach. Did it feel different than it used to? More gelatinous? Or gelatinous? That's a very nice word. I like that. Mott groaned and swiped the bag of crackers off his lap. They hit the floor with a muffled crunch, and Mott slid all the way under his covers, pulling them up over his head. He wanted to escape, to hide from the world. No, what he wanted was to hide from the sea bonnies and from himself. You can't hide, the whispers told him. Yeah, Mott said. Watch me. Mott covered his ears and started humming. That's where his mum found him, under his covers, humming like a little kid, when she came into his room still in her robe, to check on him. Mott? He threw back the covers and looked at her. Apparently he looked worse than he felt. As soon as her gaze landed on her face, on his face, she frowned and said, You're staying home again today. He didn't argue with her. After his mum and Rory left the house, Mott dropped back into sleep, but he didn't stay asleep for long. This was unfortunate, because as soon as he was awake, his mind was inundated by the whispers again. The whispers in Mott's head, however, were no longer whispers. They were full-on shouts. If he didn't drown them out, he was going to lose his mind. Mott threw back his covers and dashed to his desk to get his earbuds. Putting them in, he started filling his ears with driving rock music. He could still hear the shouts. What could he do? He looked around, his gaze landing on his, sh on his shelves. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I thought I was in the wrong place. Uh, his gaze landing on his shelves, he reached out and picked up one of his handheld video games. He got back under the covers and he turned on the game. Mott spent the better part of the day trying to drown out the shouts, but not even deafening rock music and fast-moving video games could beat them down. Then, some, sometime during that afternoon, maybe a little after 2pm, Mott started feeling old. When he stopped his game to figure out why he felt that way, he realised he had a strange vibration in his chest and belly. It was like the very faintest suggestion of movement, as if something was shaking his organs from the inside. He felt like his heart... Wait. He felt like his heart... Okay, there's, there's no end to that sentence. That's weird. He felt like his heart... something. Well, I apologise for that, there's, there's weird formatting there. And it's just cut off the sentence, so hopefully we haven't missed anything. Uh, but it continues with, Mott picked up the phone and called Dr. T's cell phone. He didn't want to go through to Claudia. Hello? This is Dr. Tabor. Uh, Mott gripped the phone. Dr. T, this is Mott. Hey, Mott, how are you feeling this morning? Um, that's the thing, I still feel weird. Still cramping? Not so much cramping as, um, like, shaking on the inside. Like, my organs are, um, trembling. For four seconds, Mott counted. The only thing he heard through the phone was the faintest of hisses in the line. Then Dr. T said, Let's do this. I'm on your way over to the hospital uh, uh, to visit a couple of patients before I head home for a while. I need to go back in late tonight to work on inventory with Claudia, so I'm leaving the clinic early. Why don't I stop by and get you? We'll see if we can squeeze you in for a CAT scan. <laughs> CAT scan. Shouldn't be a problem. Given what you're telling me, I can get insur insurance approval for it. Do you want me to talk to your mum before I come over? I'll do it, Mott said quickly. He didn't want to worry his mother. Dr. T was quiet for another few seconds. Okay, I'll talk to her later, after the scan. That'd be good. As soon as he hung up the phone, Mott scribbled a note for his mum on the back of the note she'd left for him, just in case she got home before he did. The, not was, the note was filled with lies, but the truth was out of the question. What was he supposed to write? Mum, I've gone to get a scan to see if sea bonnies are eating me from the inside out. No, that wouldn't be a good idea. He settled with an evasive lie. Mum, I'm feeling better. 
Gone out to get some fresh air. We'll call later. Love you, Mott. Mott sat in front of Dr. T's small oak desk in his clinic's office. Dr. T was on the phone talking to another doctor, one who had analysed the CAT scan. Mott wasn't listening to what Dr. T was saying. He really didn't care at this point. He'd heard enough from Dr. T himself. Now, he was just trying to stay calm, so he was leaning forward, his elbows on his knees, and he was staring at his shoes. There was a brown speck on one of his white athletic shoes. He was using it as a focal point, concentrating on on it the way a seasoned meditator might stare at a candle. He wondered if he should try a mantra, or maybe an om. He needed something uh, to tether him to sanity because the facts were dragging him quickly toward madness. Apparently the scan had revealed, had revealed abnormalities in Mott's stomach, intestines, lungs and heart. They look variegated in a way that was inconsistent with normal tissue. Dr. T and the other doctor were now discussing potential causes of the abnormalities. Were they tumours? Were they evidence of some sort of systematic infection? No and no. The doctors knew of no biological cause that could be responsible for the scan's results. Mott didn't care about the discussion because he already knew what had caused the variegated appearance of his organs. He'd seen it as soon as Dr. T had shown Mott his scan. Here's what the CAT scan revealed, Dr. T had said tapping a few keys on his laptop to bring up the images of Mott's scan. Dr. T had pointed to light-coloured clumps clustered together all through Mott's intestines, his stomach, his lungs and his heart. The clumps were greyish white, and they had small dark specks sprinkled throughout. At first glance, the specks appeared to be random, but when Mott had been closer to Dr. T's computer screen, it was obvious the specks weren't ha haphazard. No. The specs came in pairs, and they weren't specs, they were eyes. <gasps> if you really studied the clumps, you could see that they were made up of elongated forms, each vaguely rabbit-shaped, each with two dark dots. Wow. Mott had almost thrown up when he'd seen the truth of what was going on inside him, but for some reason he hadn't been able to. He gagged, but nothing had come up. Dr. T hung up the phone, steepled his fingers, and looked at Mott across his desk. Dr. Jenkins and I agree that the scan's abnormalities or anomalies don't fit anything seen before. That's a good thing. It means that the scan's results are likely caused by an issue with the scan itself, interference with the machine. He suggested we repeat the scan tomorrow morning, and I think that's a good idea. Mott tore his gaze away from the brown spot on his shoe. He looked at Dr. T. Ignoring the rippling sensation that he felt in his chest, he said, We don't need to repeat the scan. I know what it is. He was shocked by how calm he sounded. His words were totally flat. Too flat, actually. He sounded a little like a robot, but that was just because he was too stunned to bother with putting infection, inflection in his words, sorry. Dr. T frowned at Mott. What do you think it is, Mott? Is there something you haven't told me? Mott's figure, Dr. T thought Mott had taken something he shouldn't have taken. In a way, he had, but not on purpose. Uh, Mott shook his head. No. I mean, yes, but it's not what you think. Dr. T raised his eyebrows and waited. The thing is, Mott said, scooting forward in his seat. A few days ago, Rory got some sea bonnies from Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. I really like how a lot of the time in the Fazbear Fright stories, we've seen people who have, who should have gone to the doctor but didn't and then suffered the consequences. For example, Stanley in Room for One More. And there's a lot more examples of that. Uh, throughout the Fazbear Fright series. Uh, but now we're getting one where someone is actually telling the Doctor the insane story that they're going through. And I really want to know if it ends well or if it if it ends badly still. Uh, that, this is very intriguing. Um, a few days ago, Rory got some sea bonnies from Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Dr. T frowned a question. They're kind of like sea mon monkeys, Milt said. You know, those brine shrimp things? Dr. T nodded. A couple of days after they hatched, Mott continued, I noticed that Fritz, Rory's goldfish, which shared the tank with the sea bonnies, didn't look right. When I really looked at him closely, he was no longer a goldfish. It was like all the sea bonnies had eaten him from the inside out, infested him. Mott could tell from Dr. T's blank expression that Mott was losing him. 
When Dr. T opened his mouth to speak, Mott started talking faster, almost running his words together the same way Rory did when he got excited. That's what made me realise I had to get rid of the things, which I did, I flushed them, and Rory was all upset. But later that night, I got a drink of water and I felt something go down my throat and I tried to convince myself it wasn't a sea bunny, but now I think it is. And I think it started eating my tissue and it multiplied and now my insides are turning into sea bonnies, the same way Fritz turned into sea bonnies. They're eating me from the inside and they're coming together to replace my organs. I think that's why I feel so weird on the inside, like I'm jiggling from within. Like gelatin, sort of, but not exactly. Mott stopped talking. He concentrated on breathing in and out, which for obvious reasons was becoming harder than usual. He tried not to think about masses of sea, sea bodies roiling around together to form the walls of his lungs. Dr. T took a deep breath. It's time to call your mom. Mott slumped in his chair. Ah! Uh, and now it's just going to be like, hey, you need to go, you need to, go to uh, a, a psychologist. Oh no. Oh no. This story is crazy. I really want to know what the ending is. I hope it's good. Several hours later, near midnight, uh, Mott sat on the edge of his bed. Once again, he was staring at the brown spot on his shoe. He'd been staring at his shoe for a long time, an abnormally long time. He was staring at it mostly because he didn't know what else to do. He stared at it through the better part of the evening, listening to Rory chatter at his mum, listening to his mum trying to get Rory to calm down and go to bed, listening to Rory finally settle into his room listening to his mum's footsteps pause outside Mott's door and then continue on to her room. Obviously, she decided to deal with him in the morning. Outside, thunder rumbled. Finally, the weather suited the situation. I was about to say, that's pathetic fallacy right there. Uh, when they left the clinic earlier in the evening, Mott had noticed the ozone! Ah! Mott had noticed the ozone smell in the air and he turned his face up to the soft rain starting to fall. For an instant, it had soothed him, but just for an instant, a streak of jagged lightning on the horizon had brought him back to his intolerable reality. Nothing he was facing could be eased by a little bit of rain. Now the rain matched how Mott felt. It wasn't soft or soothing. It was, in it was angry and insistent. He could hear it thrumming on the roof, assaulting the house like thousands of jackhammers trying to drill through the shingles. When Mott's mum had brought him home and asked him to go up to his room, she'd followed him as far as his doorway. Then she'd said in the strained voice she used when she was trying to remain calm but wanted to scream hysterically, Please stay here. We'll talk later. For hours, Mott had been thinking about what that talk would be like. How would he convince her he wasn't crazy? Did he even want to try? Wouldn't it be better if he was crazy? When you weighed the pros and cons, crazy was definitely the preferred scenario. If he was crazy, the worst that could happen was that he might get into a mental hospital for a while. Maybe he'd have to do some group therapy, talk about feelings, and eat yucky tapioca pudding. Tapioca pudding, sorry. Uh, but he'd be mott. He'd be mott, made up of his own parts. A human. Normal. The alternative to crazy was being not mott. Absolutely unable to forget what not Fritz had looked like. Mott had knew that when the sea bodies were done with him, if they were consuming him from the inside, Mott wouldn't be anything remotely resembling a human, and that meant Mott's life would be over. He wanted to convince himself he was going crazy, he really did, but the problem with that was the CAT scan. He wasn't the only person who had seen something weird on the scan. Dr. T had seen it, and so had the other doctor. They hadn't seen sea bodies, of course, because their minds didn't let them entertain something so absurd. Something so outside the bounds of what science understood to be possible. But they had seen something. Mott wasn't imagining the physical changes in his body. This was a very worrying fact. Mott felt an inch on his forearm. Then, then, he idly scratched it. It still itched. He scratched harder. When the spot kept itching, he looked down at his arm. And there, where it itched, something moved just under his skin. Ah! Oh! oh, that's horrifying. Mott stood up so fast he got dizzy and immediately collapsed back onto the bed. He swallowed hard and stared at his arm. Yes, there, the faintest of elongated lumps were slithering under his, the surface of his skin. Mott groaned. His whole forearm started to itch, and he scratched at it so hard that he broke the skin. In horror, 
he stared at the blood welling up. Flicking up through, the, through that blood, the tail of a sea bonnie squirmed in the thick redness, his eyes nearly bugging out of his head. Mott watched the sea bonnie tail disappear as the sea bonnie dove back down under his skin. If he could have sawed his arm off and thrown it away, he would have. His whole arm itched now, and he could see that the movement was all up and down his arm. Not only that, his skin was changing colour. Right in front of his eyes, his skin was losing its normal pigment. It was becoming translucent, and his skin was turning a shade of purple-blue. Mott looked over at his other arm. The same thing was happening to it. For several seconds, Mott didn't move, not at all. He wasn't even sure he was breathing. He became a statue, a frozen collection of mutating cells overseen by a brain incapable of accepting the impossible transformation. Because this had to be impossible. He could not be sitting here watching sea bonnies eat his skin from the underneath. He was not seeing them take bite after bite of his cells, ingesting and integrating what used to be part of him and turning it into more of them. He was not being devoured and replaced by sea bonnies. This was not real. Maybe there was something wrong with his eyes. Maybe he was hallucinating. Suddenly able to move, as if released from some paralytic drug or an evil magic spell, Mott jumped to his feet and ran to his dresser. Leaning over the top of it, pushing aside his deodorant and his hairbrush, he peered into his own eyes in the mirror, and he saw a sea bonnie swim through the white surrounding his left iris. Then he saw two wind, uh, two wind around the darker flecks of the brown in his right iris. No. <laughs> Mott lost what was left of his grip on reality. He ran for his door, intending to flee the house, but he stopped when he heard his mother's voice in the hallway. He couldn't face her like this. What if he infected her? He needed to get back to Dr. T. Now that it was obvious that it was happening to Mott, maybe Dr. T could help him. Dr. T had said he was going back to his clinic to work that night. Mott had, ne had to get to the clinic. Mott whirled and raced to his window. Throwing it open, he popped the screen and climbed out into the night, onto the roof of the deck. Immediately, the rain stung his skin and his eyes. He didn't care. He crawled quickly to the edge of the porch roof, and he bent over to grab the top of a downspout. Not concerned about cutting his hands, Mott wrapped them around the metal and swung his legs over the edge of the roof. Grasping the gutter sprout with his, with his arms and legs, he slid down like a fireman's pole, and he hit the ground hard. His ankle turned, and, his, and pain shot up his leg, but he ignored it. He also ignored the pain throbbing in his hands. Mott looked out into the darkness extending behind his house. Why hadn't he brought a flashlight? Well, maybe because he was a little distracted by being eaten by sea bonnies. That was a reasonable excuse. Between the night and the rain coming down in almost solid walls of water, it was nearly impossible to see. That was okay. He knew his yard, and he knew the forest behind it. He would find his way. He would have gone out to the sidewalk where streetlights would show him the way, but he didn't want to be by the street. There were too many cars with bright headlight beams he didn't want to be caught in. So Mott sloshed through the grass in his yard and he scaled the fence at the back. He figured he could follow the green belt through his neighbourhood. He knew if he stuck to the relatively narrow band of trees, they'd eventually lead him back to Dr. T's clinic. It was just a mile or so away. He could walk it. Mott was so drenched by the time he reached the trees that his clothes clung to him like they were a part of him. Or maybe they were part of the sea bonnies now. Light from the houses along the green belt uh, reached into the forest, enough so Mott could see that the ground was covered with standing water. Huge puddles had formed in the spongy loam under the old trees. The water was getting caught up in the depressions between vast root systems stretching uh, through the underbrush. Mott ran through the puddles and stumbled over no knobby roots, occasionally falling th against a rough tree trunk. As he ran, he scratched his arms which still itched incessantly, intensely. He couldn't stop digging at himself. Not long after Mott left his house, he didn't know how long, because time was beginning to be something that made no sense to him, Mott scratched so hard at his bicep, and when he punched his hand away, he saw in the yellow glow from someone's porch light that he'd torn out a huge chunk of his own flesh. No, not his own flesh. When Mott looked at what was held in his hand, he recoiled, staggering back into the branches of an old oak tree. Instead of embracing him, the twigs prodded and speared him. But that didn't matter. 
Nothing mattered but the fact that Mott was holding a handful of madly swimming sea bonnies instead of the flesh he thought he'd pulled away from his arm. Sickened, Mott flushed the swimming creatures to the ground. He started to hurry on, but he noticed the sea bonnies were swimming energetically, coming together in an organised school to, to follow the rivulets from one puddle to the next. He stopped and stared, then realised they were swimming after him. They were pursuing him. Mott took off. He started reeling through the trees, zigging this way and that, not just to avoid the trees, but to evade the sea bonnies coming after him. He wished he could hear them advancing so he knew where they were. He knew better than to stop and turn to see them. They'd catch up if he did. But he couldn't hear them. Mott could hear nothing but the staccato... I don't know why I said it like that. Staccato rhythm of the rain and his own rapid breathing. He managed about ten ungainly strides over the uneven ground before he tripped and went down on one, onto one knee. As soon as he did, the sea bonnies were there. He couldn't see them, but he could feel them. They immediately swam up his jeans and found their way to his arms, where they reattached, him, reattached themselves. Mott could feel his body reabsorbing the wriggling creatures. He also realised he could feel the sea bodies all through his body now. They were in every vein, every artery, every organ, every nerve, every system in his entire body. They were everywhere. Mott turned his face to the sky and he screamed. He screamed out his fear, his, belief, his disbelief and his rage. He screamed at the insanity of it all. He screamed because what else could he do but scream? He didn't know how to fight this battle. He didn't understand it. He couldn't even believe it. He was also pretty sure he had lost it. But then again, maybe it wasn't too late. Maybe Dr. T could help him. Mott had to get to the clinic. Mott started running again, squinting to see through the rain and the trees. He wiped his eyes, but instead of clearing his vision, this just swiped away another glop of sea bonnies. He flicked it off his fingers, and in the glow for and in the glow from someone's pool lights, he could see it hit a tree branch. Immediately, the sea bonny slithered down the trunk, found a narrow channel of water between two roots, and followed it back to Mott. He felt the sea bonnies slip up his shin as he kept running. Finally, Mott reached the end of the green belt. He careened off one last tree, and he stepped out onto the rain-pounded sidewalk that led to the back door of the clinic. No, that wasn't right. He didn't actually step out, he flopped out. He couldn't step up anymore because it was constantly coming apart. With every motion he made, pieces of flesh fell away and turned into a heaving swell of sea bonnies, which swam chaotically and then coalesced into a formation that once again sought their fellows, and they, of course, were in Mott. Not Mott. Oh my god. This is crazy. Mott wasn't Mott anymore and he knew it. He tried to dismantle himself. He pulled at his cheeks, at his ears, at his arms, at his chest, at his hips. He tore off handfuls of his flesh and tissue, throwing them aside. He realised some remote part of his brain, maybe a part not yet infested by sea bonnies, thought that if he could tear through and tear enough of himself away, he might unearth the few cells of Mott that was still Mott. But each time Mott discarded parts of himself, the parts became determined masses of sea bonnies that doggedly uh, found a way back to him, reattaching and reassimilating faster each time he tried to toss them. They were now doing that so powerfully that Mott even heard a sound when they came rushing back to him. It was a slurp, kind of like sucking the last bit of a milkshake through a straw. But that description was too benign. The sea bonnies weren't benign. They were malevolent, through and through. All the sea bonnies wanted to do was vanquish every aspect of Mott. They wanted to vanquish him and conquer him. They wanted to be more than a colony. They wanted to be an empire. That's a line from before. And I'm pretty sure that the person who said that was his brother, Rory. I'm pretty sure. Uh, an empire formerly known as Mott. No matter what Mott did to resist them, the sea bonnies retaliated and resurged. They filled back in every hole created by his self-demolition efforts. When the chunks of flesh Mott lobbed away hit the ground, they immediately separated into swimming sea bonnies, which get, began returning to Mott. To get to him, they followed the standing water on the ground. They used the puddles. They even took advantage of falling raindrops. Any and all water became a conduit, leading the sea bonnies back to Mott. Once they reached him, the sea bonnies sought any ingress they could find. They swam up his pant legs, they slithered around his shirt, they wriggled over his shoes, they returned to themselves. They returned to him themselves, sorry, and their version of Mott every single time. As Mott fought this battle, 
he managed to get around the outside of the clinic. He was now close to the front door, collapsing every few seconds as he attempted to extract parts of himself, only to have them reform uh, immediately afterwards. Mott realised he had very little time left. He realised his thoughts were not really thoughts anymore. They were fragments. He was having trouble thinking of the people he cared about. His mum, Rory, friends, and Teresa. He, had, he tried to conjure images of them in his head, but he could only see pieces of them. Soon, he'd no longer be anything like what he used to be. How much time did he have? Maybe minutes, maybe seconds. Of the trillions of cells that had originally made up Mott, he figured only a few thousand were still as they'd been before the Sea Bonnie invasion. Mott managed to last few feet to the clinic door. Uh, sorry, Mott managed the last few feet to the clinic door. He reached for it, only to have his hand disintegrate in front of him and drop to the wet concrete. Claudia looked up from a computer screen, out through the darkened waiting room to the blackness beyond the clinic's windows. The clinic was hushed and still, and perhaps because it was so quiet, in spite of the storm, he could, she could hear something outside. It was kind of like a splashing sound, but not a normal rain spattering the ground sound. It was a bigger sound than that. It sounded like something large and squishy was falling into a body of water now and then. What Claudia heard between the splashes was odd too. She heard the, a sort of suctioning sound, almost a whistling. This was similar to the weird noise her vacuum made whenever she accidentally sucked up something wet. After the third time she heard that sound, Claudia decided to look outside the clinic to see what might be causing the peculiar noises. Making sure her computer was secure, Claudia stood and walked through the hushed waiting room. Hesitating for a couple seconds by the door, and not sure why, Claudia eventually pushed the heavy glass door open. She peered out into the deluge and saw Mott. Mott stood there as if standing in heavy rain was a perfectly normal thing to do. The rain sluiced through over his brown hair, which was matted to his head. It ran down his face, and it pattered against his clothing. Claudia wasn't sure what to make of this. She decided to act the same way Mott was acting, as if everything was normal. Well, hello, Mott, Claudia said. She kept her expression neutral. Claudia had known Mott since he was a baby. He was a nice boy, never a problem at the clinic. He'd been in yesterday and this morning, she knew. She didn't know why Dr. T didn't discuss his patients with Claudia, even when the patient was almost part of the family. Mott didn't look particularly healthy though. He had an unnatural bluish tint, and he was so pale that he was almost see-through. When Mott didn't respond to her, Claudia asked, are you okay? Suddenly, Mott smiled. Yes, it's a nice day. Everyone should be outside. Again, Claudia was a little nonplussed. She leaned forward to look in Mott's eyes. She was checking to see if his pupils were okay. They did. She smiled at him. He smiled back. Then he turned and walked away into the rain. Claudia tried to see where he was going. She thought maybe she could call him back, but it was too late. The rain was coming down so relentlessly that once Mott was a few feet away, he seemed to disappear. Oh. Okay. Okay, that's not the direction I thought that that story was going to go. <laughs> also, my throat's very dry. Let me just have a drink. Okay. That was pretty good. I like that. Uh, I think it could have been a lot better. Honestly, like, I think it had a lot of potential. I really enjoyed the beginning of the story. Uh, I feel like Rory just kind of left the story halfway through. I feel like he could have come back in some way. Um, also, I thought it was interesting with the, uh, the clinic and how they didn't say anything when he told them the full story. They were just like, go home, go and tell somebody, we can't help you, we're not therapy, uh, go get therapy, you know? Um, I find that interesting how they, how they don't even, like, try to help at all. Uh, I don't actually, I don't know, I don't know what happened here. This is very confusing. It sounds a little bit like Michael, I guess, and maybe Ennard, maybe an Ennard parallel. Huh, I, I don't know. But thank you so much for watching. Tell me what you think in the comments below, and I will see you in my next audiobook, which is Together Forever. Yay. <laughs> see you later.